May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. In 1174, the Italian architect Bonanno Passano, it's a great name, isn't it? Bonanno Passano, began work on what would become his most famous project, a freestanding bell tower for Pisa Cathedral that would measure just over 185 feet tall and contain 296 steps from top to bottom. There was just one problem. The soil on which it was built was softer than anticipated, and the foundation was far too shallow to adequately support the planned structure. And before long, the whole thing began to tilt. It took 176 years to build the Tower of Pisa, and during that time, many things were done to try to compensate for the tilt. The foundation was shored up, soil was removed from underneath the raised end, and the upper levels were even built at an angle. However, nothing could be done to make it straight. Although it has stood for over 800 years, the leaning Tower of Pisa still leans 18 feet away from where it should be. One day, experts say the tower will eventually fall because it wasn't built on the right foundation. Foundations are critically important. They're the chief means of support, whether you're building a tower, bridge, or house. In his parable of the wise and foolish builders in Matthew 7, Jesus describes two guys who each build a house. The wise builder builds on rock and the foolish builder on sand. Both houses are hit by a storm and only the one built on rock, on a solid foundation, remains standing. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, the Apostle Paul writes, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. These words are so important for us. Living Waters Anglican Fellowship is a church plant that we are building in partnership with God. And Paul makes it very clear that the kind of church we're called to build needs to have a strong and secure foundation. It needs to be founded firmly on the person and work of Jesus. If we build on any other foundation, if we make this church about anything other than Jesus and his word, we will be like the guy who built his house on on sand. When the storms come, when challenges and hardships hit us, the church will fall. I'm beginning a series today that I hope will help us build on a solid foundation. It is called A Time to Build, Lessons from the Book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of the great characters of the Old Testament. And his story is all about taking risks, following God, stepping out in faith, pursuing a vision, and building. Does that sound familiar? For 40 years, King David expanded the nation of Israel in both breadth and influence and knowledge of God, and the people enjoyed relative peace and prosperity. However, things went downhill from there. After David's son Solomon died, Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Because of their disobedience to God, God allowed the Assyrians to conquer the northern kingdom and scatter them. And in 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army invaded the kingdom of Judah. Jerusalem was destroyed, the walls were knocked down, the temple was burned, and the people were exiled and forced into slavery. Israel's history had come full circle. This shouldn't have been a surprise. God's prophets had been warning the people for over a hundred years that this would be the consequence of their disobedience. However, the story doesn't end there. Even as he prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah also spoke about God's faithfulness to his people and the promise of restoration. Jeremiah 25 verse 11 reads, This entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. In 539 BC, the Babylonian empire was conquered by the Persians, And God moved Cyrus, the Persian king, to issue a decree in 538, permitting some of the Jews to return to their homeland, exactly 70 years after their captivity. 
just as Jeremiah had prophets had prophesied. This was not a quick process and happened in three stages over a period of 100 years. The first remnant of 50,000 returned with Zerubbabel to find the city of Jerusalem completely destroyed and faced opposition from the non-Jews living in the area that made their efforts to rebuild very difficult. Again, God was faithful, sending the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to encourage them and Ezra the priest to help restore their spiritual fervor. This brings us to Nehemiah. Just take a moment to catch your breath. The book of Nehemiah records the history of the third group to return to Jerusalem. Much of the book is written in the first person between 445 and 432 BC by Nehemiah, a Jewish official working in the court of King Artaxerxes. One of the overriding themes in the book is prayer. The book opens with prayer in Persia and closes with prayer in Jerusalem. Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1 is the first of 12 prayers recorded in the the book. Prayers of adoration, thanksgiving, confession and petition. Prayers of anguish, joy, protection, dependence and commitment. Prayer gives Nehemiah perspective. It widens his horizons, sharpens his vision and dwarfs his fears and anxieties. In fact, Nehemiah's story teaches us that endeavors that are begun in prayer and covered in prayer are the ones most likely to succeed. This morning, I want to begin this series by looking at five steps in Nehemiah's process of prayer, a process that has great relevance to us as we continue in this task of building a new Christian community in Kingston. Step number one concern about the problem. Nehemiah 1 verses 1 to 2 reads, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah son of Hakaliah. In late autumn in the month of Kislev in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes reign I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani one of my brothers came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. As a cupbearer to the king, Nehemiah's job was to taste the king's wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Although this might not sound like a good job to us, a royal cup, as royal cupbearer, Nehemiah enjoyed intimate access to the king, influence and political standing in the court, and a place to live in the palace. We're told Nehemiah was so concerned about what was happening in Jerusalem that when his brother returned from a road trip there, he asked him for a first-hand report. Sometimes it can be so easy for us to stay uninvolved and unaware. We don't want to think about the stuff that's going on in our our lives, much less take the time to investigate what's happening in the lives of others, such as the plight of Syrian refugees. Nehemiah was born in exile. He'd never been to Jerusalem, but he'd heard stories. He knew that his ancestors had been led away in chains by the Babylonians. He knew of the state of ruin of the city. And he knew of Cyrus's decree to allow a remnant to return almost a hundred years before. As a Jew born in exile and living in exile, Nehemiah was doing what the prophet Jeremiah instructed the exiles to do. You survivors of the sword, go, do not linger. Remember the Lord in a distant land and think on Jerusalem. As Nehemiah thought on Jerusalem, he listened to the port or to the report. Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The words great trouble come from the Hebrew Ra, which suggests the people had broken down and were falling to pieces. Walls mean very little in our modern societies. However, in ancient times, they represented power, protection, an architectural achievement. They offered safety from attack and symbolized strength and peace. Without walls, God's people were vulnerable. And they were the laughing stock of their neighbors. Nehemiah was crushed by the complacency of the people in Jerusalem. They were living in ruins and they'd accepted it. This can happen so easily. We become complacent about the way our life is going 
And like those living in Jerusalem, we consciously or unconsciously choose to live amidst the rubble and ruin. After a while, we don't even notice it. It becomes the new normal. When we find ourselves in this situation, we need to ask ourselves, am I ready for change? Am I ready to allow God to do some rebuilding? In order for this to happen, we need to be concerned about the problem. We need to care. Nehemiah had two responses to this report. Number one, an emotional response. Verse 4 reads, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for 40 days. Nehemiah was so overwhelmed with emotion, he fell to the ground and wept for 40 days. Number two, a spiritual response. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Fasting was only required once a year on the Day of Atonement. However, we know from comparing the dates that Nehemiah fasted and prayed for four months. Nehemiah reminds us that things rarely change until we become concerned, until we allow ourselves to be affected in such a way that we are inspired to do something. I'm beginning to discover that building a church isn't easy. It takes a lot of work. How concerned are you about this new thing that God is doing in and through us? Number two, conviction about God's character. <clears throat> conviction about God's character. Nehemiah 1.5 reads, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Nehemiah describes God in four ways. Number one, Lord, which comes from the Hebrew word yud heh vav the divine name of God. And calling him this, Nehemiah acknowledges God's sovereignty and holiness. He knew his place. God was God, and he was not. Number two, God of heaven. Nehemiah declares in a pagan land that his God was beyond the earthly realm and above all other gods. Number three, great and awesome. Nehemiah is saying here that God deserves to be honored, revered, and feared by all. And number four, Nehemiah describes God as the one who keeps his covenant of love. No matter what happened, no matter how desperate the situation got, Nehemiah knew that God was bigger that nothing was beyond his power to save and redeem. He trusted in God's character, in his faithfulness, and in his strength. Nehemiah served King Artaxerxes of Persia, the most powerful man alive at that time. However, compared to God, Artaxerxes was nothing. Nehemiah lived in Susa, one of the richest cities in the known world. And he was concerned for an insignificant little city thousands of miles away. How are both cities, one rich, the other poor, one powerful, the other weak, one proud, the other broken, were like tiny specks of dust under the vast canopy of God's heaven. No matter how bad things get, no matter how big the challenge, God is more than able. There's a sign hanging in our kitchen that says, don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. Nehemiah reminds us that when we trust God and go to him in prayer, things are put into their proper perspective. How is your perspective? Do you trust in God's character? Do you trust he is more than able to do the impossible in this church? Step number three in this process of prayer is confession of sin. Confession of sin. Nehemiah 1 verses 6 and 7 reads, Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. 
we can be very quick to point the finger at someone else, to see everyone else's faults but our own. However, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 4 and 5, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Even if we can see the log in our own eye, many of us, many of us never get as far as Nehemiah. We might feel bad about our sins or be concerned about the consequences, but we hesitate to take the next step to confession, sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of pride or even ignorance. There are three ingredients here in Nehemiah's confession to God. Number one, intensity. Intensity. Overwhelmed by his sin, Nehemiah gave himself to prolonged prayer. We're told he prayed day and night, spending every moment in God's presence. Psalm 88, verse 1 reads, O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. Number two, honesty. Honesty. Surveying the grim record of Israel's past and present failure, Nehemiah made no attempt to excuse the Israelites nor himself of sin. It would have been very easy for Nehemiah to look back and, and blame his ancestors or even the guy next door. But instead, he looked within and blamed himself. Psalm 32, verse 5 reads, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will con confess my transgressions to the Lord. And number three, urgency. There are times when I've done something wrong, and I know what I have to do, but I procrastinate and take my time to confess. Can anyone relate? Not Nehemiah. He knew that sin isn't just a refusal to obey certain rules, but an act of rebellion against a holy God. He knew about the seriousness of sin and what it did to his relationship with God. And he knew about the consequences. He didn't try to sugarcoat it. He didn't procrastinate. Psalm 130 verse 1 reads, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Nehemiah reminds us that all sin, those things we've blatantly done or carelessly commit, committed, those things we've left undone, those things done in secret or in the open, must be identified and confessed. Is there anything that you need to confess? Is there anything that you need to bring to God? Don't delay. Do it today. Step number four, confidence in God's promises. Confidence in God's promises. Nehemiah 1 verses 8 to 10 reads, Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. Even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. Nehemiah recalls the words spoken to Moses about the danger of Israel's apostasy and the promise of divine mercy. This promise can be seen in Jeremiah 29.10. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Nehemiah knew that God was faithful. However, he's doing more here than just trusting in God's promises. He's holding God to them. Lord, we disobeyed and we're in captivity, but you made a promise to bring us back home and protect us. Lord, I'm claiming this promise and believing that you will make it happen. Nehemiah reminds us that the more we know of God's word, 
the better we'll be able to pray with confidence in God's promises. The, the more we'll be able to claim those promises. As we read in the message translation of Psalm 119, verse 11, I have banked your promises in the vault of my heart, so I won't sin myself bankrupt. I like that. I have banked your promises in the vault of my heart. As we build this church, what promises can we claim from God's word? Are we confident that God can and will deliver? Are we claiming them for ourselves and for this church? And finally, step number five in Nehemiah's process of prayer is commitment to get involved. Commitment to get involved. Verse 11 reads, O Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. It's been said that prayer is not getting our will done in heaven, but getting God's will done on earth. While Nehemiah was praying, his burden for Jerusalem became greater, and his vision of what needed to be done became clearer. He didn't pray for God to send someone else, but instead echoed the words of Isaiah, Here I am, Lord, send me. Nehemiah knew that he'd have to approach the king and ask for permission to journey to Jerusalem to oversee the rebuilding of its walls. And so he prayed that God would grant him success. In Nehemiah's mind, it wasn't up to the king to decide, but God. The Hebrew word for success is salah, which means prosper, profit, break out, push forward, come mightily. Nehemiah wanted to see God break out on his behalf when he went before the king to make his request. In doing this, he was claiming yet another promise in Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Nehemiah, Nehemiah reminds us that we can talk all we want. However, the true measure of our concern is is whether or not we are willing to make a commitment to get involved. Martin Luther put it this way, pray as if everything depends on God, then work as if everything depends on you. So let me ask you, how committed are you to be involved in the building of this church? Like Nehemiah, do you want to see God break out on our behalf? Nehemiah was called by God to build. As a man of prayer, his public life was an outflow of his personal life, a life steeped in and shaped by his prayerful devotion to God and his dependence on God for everything. Similarly, God has gathered us together and he has called us to build. And like Nehemiah, if we want to be successful, if we want to see Living Waters Anglican Fellowship flourish, everything we, need to do, everything we do needs to start and end with prayer. Prayer that moves us through a process of concern, conviction, confession, confidence, and commitment. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this new thing that you are doing in us and through us. We thank you, Lord, for your establishing Living Waters Anglican Fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the foundation of Christ and his word on which we build. Father, as we begin this endeavor, we pray that we would not only journey with you and partner with you, but, Father, we pray that everything we do, everything we say, would begin and end in prayer. Lord, help us to be a people of prayer. Help us, Lord, to seek your will in all things so that your will would be done in and through us. So, Father, we surrender this new church, ourselves, our lives, everything to you. We give you permission to act. We give you permission to move us forward. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace, for everything you've done, 
everything you are doing and everything that you will do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.